Hello and welcome to Hamilton the Podcast. I'm Vinton Bain. And I'm Robbie Herlocker. And we have the honor of being your obedient servants. Because today we are discussing the song Your Obedient Servant and setting up the duel between Burr and Hamilton. That's right. This song is really playful and I love the prissy, almost presumptuous feeling that this song has. You have the conflicting feelings of something really serious and dark. And the song definitely starts off with that darkness and the tones where Aaron Burr is standing there on stage and he is just singing through his teeth this hatred he has for Hamilton. And then he goes into this playful little tune and they're just playfully waltzing around in the middle of this really hard, deep, dark topic. Right. The music puts forth This idea that the letter writing is this formality and you have to be honorable and you have to put that smile on even if you're talking to your enemies and wanting to say horrible things to somebody. This is a time of honor and you have to be straight laced and always smile and grit through it. (laughs) Right. And if you've ever read any old writings and you found that some of them are really laced with sarcasm because it's interesting (laughs) the way that they find the creative ways they find to insult one another. If you're ever reading the church fathers and you read St. Jerome, this guy who helped translate the Latin Vulgate, the guy that took the Bible into the Latin language, his writings against St. Augustine and some others, he comes up with crazy, ridiculously creative insults to his friends (laughs) when he is being very presumptuous and proper, but then he lets in a little bitty a slide to let people know that he's being sarcastic or silly and insulting. And that's what happens here when you're reading about the correspondence between Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. They're writing letters to each other that have a very serious consequence, but they're going to let get let little jabs slip in. They're going to let little sarcastic comments slip in there, like they're mocking one another in some of these lines. That's right. We left off last time discussing the election of 1800, and how, at least in the musical, Hamilton specifically kept Burr from becoming president, kept him out of the room where it happens, and Burr said, that's the last time. That's right. This is an air of finality here. Burr has been fed up. He's had it up to here, which is not helpful because you're not looking at me. This is a podcast. It's an (laughs) audible thing. You can't see how high he's had it up to, but he is fed up with Hamilton's crap. He's not going to let it happen anymore, and he's going to do something about it. That's right. Historically, there are a couple more things besides just meddling in the election of 1800 that Hamilton does to hurt Burr politically going forward. And in fact, after their famous duel, Aaron Burr's reputation is never the same. Exactly. And I think you even mentioned last episode, but we didn't dive into this, that Burr was wanting to run for a governor. Burr was wanting to run for governor at some point, and that's why he was even hesitant about the presidential election. That's right. And there was a moment where, because he took the vice presidency seat, he didn't get to initially put his name forward for governor. But then once it was clear after him and Jefferson had a lot of beef and they were going back and forth and it was clear that Jefferson was not going to rely on Aaron Burr as a, an active vice president, it became clear that Burr was going to be dropped from the Republican ticket. And the first choice they had was Governor George Clinton from New York state. And Aaron Burr goes up and he realizes I'm no longer on the ticket, but the governor seat that I wanted anyways is now being vacated And the next vice president is going to be George Clinton if the Republicans have their way. So I'm going to put my name forward for governor seat in New York again. After being vice president, I'm going to go back, be the executive of New York State, and it's all going to be good. I'm going to have a political future, and I'm going to represent that area. In that gubernatorial election, which gubernatorial is a fun word. Gubernatorial. You're a gubernatorial. (laughs) Notorious goober. Notorious goober. I always loved that word. It's a funny thing. I've got involved in a lot of political races here locally in Oklahoma, challenging certain gubernatorial elections. But yeah, it's a funny word. But enter Alexander Hamilton once again in Burr's life. Exactly. So when Burr puts his name forward for the New York governor's seat, there are a lot of things happening. One of the things that's happening is Aaron Burr is courting the Republicans and the Federalists for their votes, for their support which challenges Alexander Hamilton, who's trying to get back into the seat of power, trying to reclimb that political ladder because he's still the figurehead of the Federalist Party, but he's kind of that old 
person from there. He's an old political figurehead of the Federalists who doesn't have the same prominence as he had when the Washington administration was active. And so he sees now a New York personality who is more popular than him, who is courting votes from his own party, the Federalists. And he does not want to let that stand. And so he attacks Aaron Burr as his political opponent. Another thing that's happening is that there's this whole secessionist movement that is saying we need to separate the North from the South. And it wasn't necessarily a huge movement. It was a small number of people that wanted to separate the Northern colonies from the South. And a lot of people that were in that group, though, thought that Aaron Burr could be the president of the North. That's right. They thought that if he became the governor of New York, maybe he could lead the Northern colonies into a secession from the whole union and then they wouldn't need to be beholden to Virginia anymore. A lot of historians will look back and look at the secessionist movement and how Hamilton was so opposed to the separation of the states that he made sure that this person of Aaron Burr was not going to be in political power so that he could not lead the North to secede from the Union, which it's a really weak argument to say that Burr would have done that and to say that that's what supported Hamilton's opposition, primarily because when Aaron Burr was asked about it, he said some really vague comments about whether he would support secessionism or not. He probably wouldn't have risked his whole political reputation on a movement that was only supported by a small number of people in the North anyways. He was kind of politically savvy about that. And then he made this quote at one point where he said, the Northern states must be governed by Virginia or govern Virginia and there is no middle course. So he essentially said, I'm not going to support another option than being involved here. He wants more representation in the Union for the North, but he thinks that either the North has to be in charge, bossing around those southern states like Virginia, or he wants them to be submissive to Virginia, but he doesn't see this other option. So it's really not that that led Hamilton to oppose Burr. But there are a lot of things that historically led up to this rivalry happening. And so it's a really weak argument to say that it was the secessionist fears that led Hamilton to pick up his pen and write against Burr again. But whatever it was that led him here, he was led here. He picked up his pen and he wrote against Burr so that at every single point in Burr's life, he thinks that Hamilton is that blocking point that stopped him from reaching the seat he wanted. And in that whole conflict, it started a large number of pamphlets getting circulated. We call this the pamphlet war, where Burr's reputation, among other things, was raked through the mud in the press. And while we don't know the specifics of everything that went into Hamilton writing against Burr, and we don't also know everything that was said between them, we ha- we do have the letters and we do have written correspondence to know some of it. And what sparks this whole thing bringing us into this song is a letter that was written by Dr. Charles Cooper, who mentions Alexander Hamilton having a bad opinion of Burr. It's not even a letter that Hamilton himself wrote. That's right. The metaphorical straw that broke Aaron Burr's back that called to action this particular interaction, this affair of honor, was not from the pen of Alexander Hamilton, but it was Charles Cooper who was at a dinner party once. He said politics came up. Hamilton was there, and he said a lot of things about Aaron Burr. In Charles Cooper's letter, he wasn't specific about what it was Hamilton said. He said that a lot of things were discussed about Aaron Burr, though. And I could detail to you a still more despicable opinion which General Hamilton has expressed of Mr. Burr. And that phrase, still more despicable, is what set Aaron Burr off. Right. And that's what leads us right into our lyrics in this specific song. This is Burr. Reacting, obviously, to the things that have happened in our musical, but from a historical standpoint, reacting to a lot more even. And he starts that, how does Hamilton, and you're going to hear that normal refrain that he has, that opening that he has in different songs throughout this musical. Here, instead of being surprised, instead of even being flummoxed by this, he's now sounding spiteful. You get this real anger coming across. Right. How does Hamilton, an arrogant immigrant, Orphan, bastard, whore's son, somehow endorse Thomas Jefferson, his enemy? A man he's despised since the beginning just to keep me from winning? I want to be in the room where it happens. And you've kept me from the room where it happens for the last time. This vitriol, this absolute passionate rage against Hamilton is just seeping through the way that Leslie Odom Jr. delivers these lines. 
It's interesting to me that when Aaron Burr comes in and gives this narration voice, most of the musical, he is very matter of fact. He says, how does the bastard orphan immigrant decorated war vet unite the colonies through more debt, fight the other founding fathers till he has to forfeit, have it all, lose it all. You ready for more yet? It's as if he's speaking to the audience. He is above the action. He is narrating. He is speaking about what is happening on stage. He's talking about Hamilton here. We don't see that distant narrator. We see Aaron Burr, who is in the action, who is actively responding to the events that have happened on stage. And so his voice is not the passive, overarching narration voice. It is the passionate, I am engaged in this and I am angry about it voice that we can only assume Aaron Burr has in this exact moment of his life. We don't have to assume it. It it is portrayed here very well. That's right. And I like in the music here, there is the sound of a door shutting, a big heavy door like clattering to a shut. And it's right before he starts saying he wants to be in that room where it happens. You've kept me from the room where it happens. It's like the door shut on him to that room where it happens for the last time. Yeah, it's creative. Speaking of how Hamilton is the force that kept Burr from the room where it happened, which is absolutely true in the text of our musical. That is what happened in this musical. One of the things I was reading this week was reviewing some passages in Milton Lamasque's first volume of his biography about Aaron Burr, and he speaks about this time, and he doesn't say that it was all Hamilton's doing. Yeah, Hamilton petitioned the House of Representatives and the Federalists there. Yeah, he meddled in the election of 1800, and he had meddled in the gubernatorial race of New York, and he had done some meddling to break the statistical tie and get people to throw away their votes so that Jefferson would become president. But it wasn't just Hamilton's actions. Aaron Burr also kept himself from the presidency's seat by being passive during the election of 1800. If he had interjected and said actively to the Federalists who were putting his name forward, I will run for your president's seat. I will support this. I will support you and I will respect certain Federalist principles that are treasured by you. I will appreciate you. If he had courted them and had appreciated what the Federalists were doing to put his name forward, he could have been pushed over the limits. And there was actually a congressman who said in a letter, had Burr done anything for himself, he would long ere have been president. Talking about how they had done lots of different votes. If Burr had just come forward and said, hey, I want this, then lots of Federalists would have supported him. Likewise, the Federalists would have supported him later on if he had countered Jefferson here and said, I'm going mm. to stab Jefferson in the back and come forward. Yeah. But he was passive about it. Also, since he was passive, Republicans might have trusted him if he had actively spoken up and stepped down and said, I don't want my name considered for presidency, put Jefferson forward. But right. because he was passive and he, and he didn't sat support back and wanted to watch what would happen and see if he would win. Exactly. So historically he had that Burresque from our musical, the Burresque attitude of waiting for it to see what would happen. And in the election of 1800, what happened was since he was inactive, since he didn't take an action on either side, the Federalists grew to distrust him. The Republicans grew to distrust him. And because he didn't have anybody's trust, he was a party unto himself, a force that Jefferson would never trust and a force that the Federalists could never really put forward again. That's right. So the next few lines of this song are where we get into the text of the letters that are being sent back and forth. That's right. And it's interesting that the off-Broadway production had different lyrics here that matched the letters just a little bit better. But for the Broadway production, when they change those lyrics, they actually matches the musical better. It gives more emotion and more feeling into the musical. The original lyrics were, Dear Alexander, I submit for your immediate perusal a letter from Dr. Charles Cooper, who was kind enough to give me his approval to reprint a letter that he sent in confidence. He claims on numerous occasions, you have called me a dangerous man. Furthermore, I ought not be trusted with the reins of government. Obviously, such an accusation must be met with either an immediate acknowledgement or disavowal. Now, are you capable of such a thing? I have the honor of being your obedient servant, A. Burr. That's right. When Lin-Manuel was Miranda was writing the Hamilton, he put a comment in the margin there of this portion of the song. And he said, originally, my lyrics for these letters were super historically accurate, but I could feel us losing the audience. I figured if they can't speak plainly here, then when? 
So he, in the original version, he wanted to be true to say, let's talk about that Charles Cooper letter. Let's talk about the actual accusations that Hamilton was leveling against Burr. Let's make this very clear, very true to history. But what he found was that by adding more historical details, what he was doing was, in the words of our friends at the Story Wonk podcast, he was putting more bricks in the backpack of the audience members. He was piling on more details, more facts that they would just have to learn. And more people were checking out instead of engaging with the conflict on stage. Instead of having to learn more, they realized that they could get more engaged in the conflict if we just went with the details that we know so far. If we scratched the idea of adding more historical details and just went straight to the point that Aaron Burr feels slighted by Hamilton and we're just going to go straight into the conflict as we know it so far so that we don't need to teach through this song. Instead, we can just illustrate the conflict you have already seen throughout the rest of this musical. So the on-Broadway lyrics, the letter we have in our musical now, starts, Dear Alexander... I am slow to anger. Well, of course you are. You wait for it, Burr. We know. (laughs) But I tow the line. As I reckon with the effects of your life on mine, I look back on where I failed, and in every place I checked, the only common thread has been your disrespect. I love that summary from Burr's perspective of Hamilton and Burr's relationship. Yeah, we know already. They keep meeting. Their lives are intertwined (laughs) here. Yeah, and you're referencing back to the Washington confrontation where Hamilton first is on stage with Washington, who chooses him to be his right-hand man instead of Burr, actively pushing Burr out of the room where it happens with Washington to begin with. And so from the beginning of the musical, Burr's ambitions were thwarted and Hamilton's ambitions were rewarded. Also, because I like pulling in other musical references, there's a slight, if not stretch reference to Les Mis from the line, I look back on where I failed. If you think about the song, what have I done in Javert and Les Mis? I had never, ever considered that parallel. It's uh, maybe just because it is kind of a stretch, so to speak, but I like the, the idea of Valjean's song where he's saying, what have I done? Sweet Jesus, what have I done? Become a thief in the night, become a dog on the run. And he goes through and he's reflecting on how, Jean Valjean has taught him a lesson throughout their entire relationship. You have the antagonist protagonist relationship in Les Mis where one of them has taught the other something. But in Valjean's situation in Les Mis, he looks back and he says that this man has touched my soul and taught me how to love. And he realizes that Jean Valjean, it was in the right. And Valjean feels like he has been the villain of the story and he takes his own life ultimately In this story, in Hamilton the Musical, we see that Aaron Burr's looking back and he sees those conflicts between their lives. And he has learned something from Hamilton, but what he learns in the end and what he decides in the end is not that he's going to be in the wrong and he admits that he was wrong. He says that Hamilton was in the wrong and Burr's not going to put his own life on the line for it. He's going to try to take Hamilton's. Burr says, you call me a moral, a dangerous disgrace. And Burr's historical letter, as we mentioned, talks about that Charles D. Cooper letter, which was written to Philip Schuyler, talking about how there was that still more despicable opinion which Hamilton expressed of Burr. That's right. So Charles Cooper says that Hamilton had a more despicable opinion of Burr that he could let forth. And then Burr challenges Hamilton saying, you need to disavow these statements. If you said something that was more despicable about me then you need to come forward and own up to it or you need to disavow these statements by Charles Cooper and you need to step forward and speak now. Hamilton, however, gives back this almost professorial, higher-than-thou attitude where he instructs Burr on how a code dwello should be started. He's, he's almost instructing him, saying, no, 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 Burr. You can't ask me to disavow something that is completely general and vague. You have to tell me exactly what it is I said. You can't just... And in fact, Hamilton has this line where he says something about how the phrase still more despicable admits to infinite shades of despicability. So what are you talking about? Are you trying to accuse me of calling you something infinitely despicable or something just like slightly more despicable? What (laughs) is this? And so Hamilton comes back and says, I don't know how to respond to you 
because you haven't given me something explicit to disavow. That's correct. And you get this idea that Hamilton is being a bit of a smart aleck in that he knows what he said, but he's going to be coy about it. But Hamilton was in his rights in these codes of honor that Burr had to say a specific thing that he was set against him for Hamilton to give an answer to. That's right. That's how these things worked. Burr was supposed to cite a specific grievance. Then Hamilton could either state, I did say that thing or I did not say that thing. Right. Hamilton responded with a big dissertation on what the word despicable might mean. And Burr found that answer to be evasive and really condescending. And the, he, he wrote back to him Burr's response. He said, the question is not whether he, being Cooper, has understood the meaning of the word or has used it according to syntax and with grammatical accuracy. But the question is whether you have authorized its application directly or by uttering expressions or opinions derogatory to my honor. Your letter has furnished me with new reasons for requiring a definite reply. Exactly. Basically saying it doesn't matter exactly what you said. What are your feelings? I mean, what feelings are you expressing to other people about me? (laughs) Yeah, Burr hoped for at least a disavowal of any type of thing that was being said against him. He wanted just a blanket statement for Hamilton to step forward and say, hey, I'm sorry for whatever they said about you. I wasn't the one involved in that. Maybe maybe Burr left him an out. He could have said something like, I only spoke politics. I was only talking about politics. I was never derogatory about your character. It would have been a little dishonest for him to necessarily say that. Lots of people had been watching for years and years the accusations that Hamilton was leveling against Burr. But here in this moment, Hamilton gets himself a little bit stuck because he now is engaged in an affair of honor. He's in a moment where he's gone too far into these affairs to back out because he he could have stopped it immediately and apologized. In fact, there were two previous times when Aaron Burr had been insulted by Hamilton. And according to Burr, he addressed these things with Hamilton and Hamilton just apologized immediately. So Burr didn't need to initiate a duel. If they apologize, no need for further action. That's right. And in this moment, Hamilton refused to apologize. And then it became too late to apologize. Yeah. And as we mentioned in the lyrics, Burr ends his letter by saying, if you've got something to say, name a time and place face to face. You can already see he's wanting this duel in the musical. Right. It kind of reminds me of all these infamous hip hop feuds that we've had that have become commonplace in the culture of rap music. So I really like that that's happening here where you have two big rap stars, quote unquote, going at each other, going, you know what? No, I'm not going to take your disrespect. And they're going back and forth, kind of like hip hop stars or rap stars from history have written these tracks back and forth, addressing each other like letters back and forth on their albums. Right. And we've talked about that dynamic being used in the cabinet rap battles in this musical, but I I like that idea. This is the thing that led Lin-Manuel Miranda to write this as a hip hop musical. It wasn't just that he was looking for anything he could apply a hip hop tune to. He was looking for something that was true to the tone of these interactions and this conflict. Yeah. And he, he said that hip hop is the appropriate medium through which we can communicate this because hip hop's all about saying, I've come up out of nothing. And I'm sometimes when you're challenged directly, you say, I'm better than you. And let me tell you why. Let me trash you. Let me talk down to you. There are a lot of different threads of hip hop history and lots of different things. And no one sentence will articulate everything that hip hop is. Those are some of the big, big concepts. And in this, you see Aaron Burr's going to lay out his case. Hamilton's going to respond and you get this bickering back and forth. And it is very hip hop. That's right. Look back on Ice Cube's separation from NWA and their back and forth. Or you can look at Biggie and Tupac and they're fighting over the different coasts. And you see this correlation to our founding fathers and their fights here. (laughs) Yes, I love that. I also love the idea of tying hip hop culture to something as foundational as our founding fathers. Because sometimes we see the hip hop culture as completely subculture. It's definitely subversive by nature in certain ways. But to root that protest language in the very heart of the American dream is a very important thing, I think, politically and socially, to just see these people as having a place in the American story and in the American drama that's unfolding. It's about representation. 
And Lin-Manuel Miranda, in so many different ways, is advancing the idea of representing different groups in this American dream. So he ends his letter saying, I have the honor to be your obedient servant, A. Burr. That very formality for such an aggressive letter, you're ending it with that happy formality. I'm your obedient servant. I love that. It's, there's almost some sarcasm there. Or just, you know, I'm following these lines, that smiling through the hatred. <laughs> and now we get Hamilton's return letter in the lyrics. So Hamilton starts off his letter here, Mr. Vice President, not even addressing him by name, just going straight to the title. <laughs> that kind of adds to the whole presumptuous uh, taunt and the tone of this language. Right. And I like to think that he's emphasizing that vice, Mr. Vice President. Remember who kept you from being president? I am not the reason no one trusts you. And we mentioned specifically from that Burr biography, there are reasons that Burr put forth himself that no one trusts him. Right. And Hamilton goes on here and he says, no one knows what you believe. I will not equivocate on my opinion. I have always worn it on my sleeve. I appreciate that because that's a good articulation of who Hamilton is, right? Right. And he just said who Burr is. He says, no one knows what you believe because you talk less and just smile more. But even on my opinion on you, and as we know, everything else that Hamilton believes, he wears on his sleeve. He's open about it. He doesn't think about this talking less. He wants to talk more. Right. And this next portion of... Hamilton's lyrics is, is what we were talking about already, where he says, you're going to have to be a little more specific. Give me something direct to disavow or to accept. And he, he says, even if I said what you think I said, you would need to cite a more specific grievance. Here's an itemized list of 30 years of disagreements. <laughs> That's right. I like this idea that Hamilton's almost writing back. And even in history, there was a little hint of this saying, Listen, I talk a lot of trash on you. You're going to have to be more specific on what trash you specifically want me to address. <laughs> right. And I love the line from Burr you, and the staging of this. We haven't really talked much about the staging, but Hamilton is in this moment sitting at the desk. He's written his letter. He's passed it along. The beginning of this song, when Aaron Burr sits down to write a letter, he passes one piece of paper to his servant who walks it over to Hamilton and delivers it. Hamilton then sits down at the desk and he writes his letters and he fills out lots and lots and lots of pages and he starts passing them to the servants and passing them to the servants and yes, each one gets another ensemble <laughs> member grabs each page. Right. And there's this assembly line. They're, they're stacking these papers one on top of the other in Burr's hands as he's standing there and you just see him getting piled down with, hey, I sent one page and I get this <laughs> several pages over and over. Which and originally in the letters... Burr's first letter was pretty short. I mean, maybe two half paragraphs or two third paragraphs. Yeah. And then Hamilton replied with about six times longer than that. It still was pretty short for a letter, but it was about six times longer than Burr's. Right. Exactly. I love that response that we see in Burr's face as he says, just sweet Jesus. Here, Hamilton continues that idea of saying, hey, I've talked about you for a long time. I've been in the public eye for this whole moment. And I, so you're going to have to be specific if you want to get into this because, hey, I have not been shy. I am just a guy in the public eye trying to do what's best for our republic. I love that rhyme scheme. It's just so basic right. that it, it's just interesting because he's, he's not a shy guy. He puts himself out there. And you're right. Often he opens his mouth and inserts his foot because of that. But no matter what. He is writing like he's running out of time. He's going to write nonstop. He is not a shy person. He is out there and his thoughts are out there. And this is one of those moments when Hamilton's not going to back down. He's not going to throw away his shot. So That's to speak. right. And he says specifically that trying to do my best for our Republic. And it's that idea, which he'll bring up that. You only stand for yourself. I'm trying to fight for this whole country. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hamilton here insists that he is the one who is speaking up for the public good. He is the public servant who is the martyr who's willing to just fight for the Republic. And he doesn't want to fight with Aaron Burr, but he also won't apologize for doing what's right. And it's kind of a reference to the fact that Hamilton probably in this context does believe that Aaron Burr cannot be trusted with the reins of government, as the original lyrics of Lin Manuel's musical said. He thinks that Aaron Burr is not the person we can trust in this office because he doesn't stand for any principles. Historically, there was an interesting moment where I was reading the Lamasque biography, and Aaron Burr is attacked by Hamilton as having no principles whatsoever. And in the same paragraph, Hamilton says that Aaron Burr is going to climb to power on the ladder of Jacobin principles. 
And it's almost like he's like, yeah. okay, so what what are you saying? Are you speaking out of both sides of your mouth? There's a contradiction here. We can reconcile it if we want to, if we want to kind of break down Hamilton's words, the way that he breaks down Burr's letter down to the nuances and grammatical syntax. We can say that maybe Burr doesn't have principles of his own, but he's climbing the ladder of people who do have Jacobin principles, letting them think that he's the leader for them. Whatever it is, neither here nor there. What we know is that Hamilton, every time he got the chance, did speak against Burr's character, and he saw that he was doing it for noble reasons. He thought it was his religious duty to challenge this person that he saw as a disgraceful, despicable person. And speaking of his religious duty, this line, I don't want to fight, we already talked about how Hamilton has come to a place in his life and he now sees dueling is a bad thing. We know that Hamilton's fine with fighting with words, but this don't want to fight, I think, refers to his knowing of an impending duel that's coming from these letters. And he even wrote an actual statement on impending duel with Aaron Burr, where he said, I am certainly desirous of avoiding this interview for the most cogent reasons. My religious and moral principles are strongly opposed to the practice of dueling, and it would even give me pain to be obliged to shed the blood of a fellow creature in a private combat forbidden by the laws. I like that it sounds like he's saying, don't make me hurt you. I don't want to have to kill this guy. I don't want to have to shed his blood, take care of this guy real quick. We don't want to waste a bullet. Right. We've talked about how in the Philip Hamilton duel, Alexander Hamilton had shown some growth and maturity since the days when he saw the first duel in this musical under George Washington. But the change that he made was not in thinking that you should never enter a duel or never glorify these people that are dissing your name. The change that he saw is that you shouldn't put the blood on your own hands. So he encourages his son to throw away his shot. But he also encourages his son to stand up for his own honor. That's right. Because you don't let anyone defame your name. You don't let anyone speak ill of Hamilton's name and Hamilton's family. And so in this moment, he expresses religious hesitation to go into a duel, even though he's been a part of several duels, never the principal to this extent, but he's been a part of a number of affairs of honor in his life. And yet he says, now I will not engage in anything that is taking the life of another person like this, but I'm also too afraid of my political reputation to just step down and let someone dishonor me. I'm not going to let someone do that. So he's in that conundrum saying, I don't want to take a life, but I also won't let someone attack my honor. So I'm going to, according to a lot of these letters, which is debated back and forth in history about whether they were sincere or not. He says, I am going to throw away my shot in at least the first round of my duel. We'll talk about what happens in the next song when we get into the specifics of how the duel goes down and the different accounts that the seconds give in their correspondence. But here we do have that letter where Hamilton expresses that I don't think that it's right for me to duel. So like Burr, Hamilton ends his letter, I have the honor to be your obedient servant, A. Ham. And in the staging there, Burr's about to take the leather, and then the ensemble member pulls it back slightly as Hamilton finishes up. Your obedient servant, A. Ham. It's almost like this sarcastic repetition of the way Burr ended his leather. He's like, no, hold on, I have to end it the way you ended yours. Right. It's it's like that little bitty last second jab at him. It's just a funny little mocking tone. I like it a lot. So when Burr initiates this confrontation, Hamilton responds with this pretty condescending response with this itemized list of 30 years of disagreements. That's right. And, and Burr's not going to be very comfortable with that. So we mentioned before, the historical letter didn't have this itemized list, but in our musical, they mentioned that. And there's a funny reference there that Lin-Manuel Miranda is homaging something. Right. In the Hamilton, he puts a reference in the margin there where he says that this itemized list of 30 years of disagreements is his Parks and Recreation homage. It's such a Leslie Nope thing to do when you would send someone an itemized list just because you're arguing with them. I think it's hilarious to have that idea of Leslie Nope going forward and presenting, because she totally would fill out a whole spreadsheet, color code it, make her Venn diagrams to show everything that they've ever disagreed on. And, and yeah, that's Hamilton. That's his type of personality. Someone made that connection on Twitter and Lemon Will Miranda replied to them and said, it's my Leslie Ron love leather in Hamilton. Ron Swanson is my hero. <laughs> For sure. Who are we kidding? Andy Dwyer is my hero. <laughs> so now in the lyrics, we get Burr's response again. 
Careful how you proceed, good man. Intemperate indeed, good man. Answer for the accusations I lay at your feet or prepare to bleed, good man. That threat in there, that foreshadowing. This foreshadowing has been a long time coming in our musical. From the very first conversation that Hamilton and Burr have had, Burr looked at Hamilton and said, you want to get ahead? Fools who run their mouths off wind up dead. That's right. And there have been lots of little homages to that type of language throughout this musical where Burr is talking to Hamilton and he says that you better be careful what you say because if you talk, you're going to get shot. And there are a lot of these things that have hinted at it and hinted at it. They're almost heavy handed, but it's so lightly done that I appreciate it. And here you see they're initiating this affair of honor, this duel that's about to happen. And Burr just lays it out. He says, this is here. We are at the cusp of this. And if you proceed past this point, then you will bleed, good man, in the mocking tone again. Yeah, he's redoubling on his threat of a duel here. And I want to read this quote from the historical letter. And he says of Hamilton's response, having considered it attentively, I regret to find in it nothing of that sincerity and delicacy which you profess to value. Your letter has furnished me with new reasons for requiring a definite reply. I like the way that's articulated there when Burr's writing back and he he says that even if I didn't have a grievance against you to begin with, your response to me is so condescending that you've given me new reasons to be really frustrated and to insist that you disavow these statements and apologize. Yeah, the way he ends that there, new reasons for requiring a definite reply, it almost says to me, demand satisfaction. Yes, exactly. Early on in this correspondence, historians have looked back and said, if Hamilton didn't write to him this long dissertation about grammatical syntax of the word despicable, if he had instead said, you know what, I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but I apologize if anything was taken out of context and it was associated with my name. I don't want this to be blown up. I was just talking politics and you know, we can disagree about politics and that's fine. And he could have done that early on. But here at this point in the letter, this is the line in the sand when in their historical correspondence back and forth, Hamilton had crossed the line and Burr would no longer accept a generic apology to generically speak against the things that were published in the letter. He wanted a specific disavowal to say, I am explicitly not talking against Aaron Burr, which was something Hamilton could not do. That's right. Hamilton's response here in our lyrics shows that he's at least willing to admit that, yeah, I talk a lot of trash about you, Burr. Your grievance is legitimate. I stand by what I said, every bit of it. Harkening back now to one of the themes, again, from the beginning of this musical, where Hamilton asked him, if you stand for nothing, Burr, what will you fall for? And he now is telling Burr, I acknowledge that you are standing for something, but you're only standing for yourself. That's right. It's what you do. He says that I can't apologize because it's true, which was Eker's response to Hamilton's son when they started their duel. So many callbacks. This is clever. It's almost like Lin-Manuel Miranda knew where he was going with this musical when he sat down to write it all. (laughs) He is a genius. So Burr now looks at Hamilton and he, he takes that challenge and he says, then stand, Alexander. Weehawken, dawn, guns, drawn. Yeah, at the beginning of the song, Burr told Hamilton to name a time and a place. But now Burr's like, you know what? I've lost patience with you. I'm picking this time and this place. We're doing this. Yep. We hawk in New Jersey in the morning with guns. Hamilton replies, you're on. I almost hear that like a really morbid game of Clue. It was Aaron Burr in We Hawkin with the gun. And that that's what happens here. You're naming yeah. the person. You're naming the place. You're naming the murder weapons. And it's the challenge has been issued. The challenge has been accepted, and they both finish this song out with the taglines, I have the honor to be your obedient servant, A. Ham, A. Burr. They're closing the chapter on their friendly correspondence, and they're moving forward into something that is not quite as friendly. And they join in together, singing that I have the honor to be your obedient servant. They're in agreement here. They're singing together in unison. I love the way that lyric is always delivered. It's so fun and peppy. It really messes with my emotions. I know something 
stuff is happening on stage. And then I just hear them saying, I have the honor to be your obedient servant. It takes me into a weird emotional space, right? Yeah. Because it's so fun and peppy. It's it's that waltzy dance where they're going back and forth and dancing together. It's it's interesting and it's really, really fun. Yeah, it's that keeping up of appearances while they are getting vengeful and ready to go to war with each other. And they sign off A dot him, then A dot Burr. And it's a little bit of a stretch, but I like that Burr gets that last word in there. One final foreshadowing that he'll have the last word in the duel. Right. He'll have the last word, but Hamilton's legacy will persevere and Burr will go down as the villain in our histories. That's right. We'll get there. So our whole musical is coming to a head here. Our two main characters are coming to that face off. What do you think of all of this going on and this culmination here? It's, I think, in my opinion, it's the perfect culmination of these two are protagonist and our antagonist. Really, if we're talking about this in story terms, the biggest antagonist is an internal antagonist that Hamilton has because he's the one who is by his own folly. His ambition is his folly. He's he's fighting with his own emotions. He's fighting himself and he's trying to get ahead, but he can't quite get past his own lust, his own pride, his own ambition is is tearing him down. He's the Icarus who flies too high. His internal antagonist is really driving the plot of this musical in a lot of ways for why he climbs up and then he falls back down. But this here, the Aaron Burr, Alexander Hamilton conflict is the primary external conflict of the musical. We see those conflicts with, I mean, obviously the war with the British and with the embodiment of King George III and the songs of the first act. And then you see the conflicts with Thomas Jefferson in the second act. But this is the conflict that has been driving the entire thrust of the musical from the beginning when Aaron Burr steps on stage and he says, I'm going to narrate to you the story of Alexander Hamilton's life. And you see from all of their correspondence up through their entire friendship and their whole relationship, there are things being piled onto Aaron Burr's plate that he is not going to take anymore. And so here, their conflict is really being painted in the most direct light that it could be. And you see that this is what their life has been pointing towards. If you knew only one thing going into this musical about the lives of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, you probably knew that one was going to get shot by the other. And within that beginning part of the musical, Aaron Burr tells you he's the fool that shot him. Yeah, he's the damn fool that shot him. So that is the thing you're waiting for. You're waiting for it. The entire musical. They tell you in the first song, I'm going to shoot him. And then here you see, oh, that's how we got here. That's how, that's what brought us to this confrontation. So we've now seen, we're starting to see the bookends of our whole musical coming to a head. And honestly, I can hardly believe that we've reached the last few songs of this musical. Me neither. Next week, we're going to be jumping into Best of Wives and Best of Women. And the world was wide enough covering the duel and the end of Hamilton's life here. But that's not going to be the end of our podcast, hopefully. Right. We have a bunch of ideas. We've mentioned it before. Hopefully on this last episode we do, we're going to dive into some more specifics and tell you about some of the places we're going to be taking this podcast. Right. Last episode in the election of 1800, we kind of hinted and teased at a couple of the types of episodes we'll be doing after the curtain closes on who lives, who dies, who tells your story. But So if you want those hints, go back and listen to it again. But we will be giving you a lot more information about what comes next in Hamilton, the podcast history. Now, soon we're going to be doing something special. As you might have heard us say at the end of a lot of these episodes, we have a Patreon account, and that's for financially supporting the podcast and keeping things going here, paying for the hardware and the storage space online, all these different things that go into this. And one of the benefits to that is you get access to special secret shows that we do every month for people who contribute. Our next one is going to be a Hamilton themed one. And we would like to ask any of you that have any Hamilton related questions whatsoever about the musical, about history, about what we do here at the podcast, anything, send them to us and we'll answer those questions in that show. That's right. You can ask us literally anything and we as your hosts will come through and we will try to wrestle with those questions. We may try to avoid the ones that are a little bit too inappropriate or personal, but we will answer any of the questions that we can to the best of our ability. So you can ask us about our favorite historical figures or who we would like to sit down to tea and crumpets with in history. (laughs) You can ask us to 
fast rap our favorite song in Hamilton. You can get into it. But all you have to do to get access to that Patreon feed is to donate as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash graphocast. And we're not historians. So while you can ask us historical questions and we will dive in and try to answer them, don't make it super complicated because we yeah. don't have access to all these hidden records and things. We're not professional historians, but we will do our best. We are just fans and we <laughs> obsess about things a lot. <laughs> That's right. And we want those historical questions. So ask them and we will research and do what we can. So be on the lookout for that. And the ways you can contact us to send those questions on Twitter at Graphocast. Email us contact at graphocast.com. By the way, that's G R A P H O C A S T. You can leave comments on the website, graphocast.com, or you can hit us up personally on Twitter. I'm at Flesh Either. And I'm at Alpha Knight. So get ready for all the action next week because we have heard that the challenge was issued. He demanded satisfaction, but Alexander Hamilton refused to apologize. So So there is need for further action. Exactly. Join us next week. This has been a Graphomania production. If you would like to hear more podcasts, go to graphocast.com. G-R-A-P-H-O-C-A-S-T dot com. Follow us on Twitter at Graphocast and like the Graphomania page on Facebook for news and updates.